morning, Gateway. It's good to be here. My name's Steve Harley. I'm the Taze Valley Campus Minister. It's kind of weird sometimes when I come up here and preach. I, I feel like I have to introduce myself, even though I've been on staff here for over 11 years, where I've been down in Taze Valley for several years now. I always feel like I've got to come and introduce myself, because some of you have not met me or seen me before. Um, Joel was mentioning, though, uh, as he did the announcements, he said something about buying a goat for uh, our people in Haiti. So if you want to buy one of those and put it in Joel's office, um, that's how we're going to be collecting them. So uh, Joel's up to, <laughs> I don't think that's going to be how it works, right? All right. All right. <laughs> anyway, we are in a series on the book of Revelation. We've been in this series for a bit now. If you've been with us, you've, you've uh, been, uh, you know that. Uh, Rick Atchley says about Revelation, he says, There are some preachers who totally avoid the book of Revelation and act as if there are only 65 books in the Bible instead of 66. And then there are those who fixate on the book and act like that's the only book in the Bible. And I, I've seen that before. Some of you have grown up having no contact with the book of Revelation, and some of you, it's like, that's all we ever talked about, right? Right. Well, try as hard as we can. We, as finite people, can't always fully understand all the prophecies and the promises from an infinite God that are put in this book of Revelation. But we, we can try. And today we're going to tackle another exciting, confusing, refreshing, and controversial section in the book of Revelation. So regardless of your passion or your fear of this book, uh, we, we do want to preach the whole counsel of God, which includes the book of Revelation. But let's be honest, you know, a lot of you didn't grow up studying the book of Revelation. And it's not like, uh, especially as kids growing up in Sunday school, this wasn't like a topic that you guys often talked about in your Sunday school classes. I mean, can you imagine some of these things that we've read being talked about in Kids Zone right now? They'd be a little bit freaked out. And so chances are you didn't have many experiences like the one we're about to watch in this video. And if you did, I, I am sorry. But check out this video. It's something that I showed to our Taze Valley campus a few weeks ago. I thought you guys might enjoy. All right, girls, it's about time to go to bed. So let's read a Bible story together, and uh, then you guys can go to sleep. Let's read tonight from, how about the book of Revelation? Sure. Sure? All right, all right. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And so then there was the Lion of Judah. Roar! The Lion of Judah! He's coming to conquer! Woo! He's worthy to open the scroll! Woo! Roar! Roar! And the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads they wore something like a crown of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. So these locusts are coming! They're gonna get you! And they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night. Tormented! Ah! Ah! I looked and there before me was a white horse and its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror. Ah! Ah! Daddy, that's not a horse, it's Sven. <laughs> they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? <laughs> Oh, the Lion of Judah! They're gonna get you! The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. All right, girls, time to get some sleep. That was exciting reading tonight, huh? My poor daughters. <laughs> 
Well, again, we are in week 10 of 11 of this series on Revelation. So we've been taking our time walking through this. But today we're going to look at uh, Revelation 19 and 20. Now, at first we're going to start with Revelation 20 and then go back to 19. So if you've, you have your Bibles, you can go over to Revelation 20. But the uh, section we're going to co- go over uh, in just a moment ha- has created endless discussions and a lot of controversy. And it ri- arises over one word in this section of Scripture, and that word is millennium. And millennium simply means a thousand years. So let's look at this, this Scripture and kind of get it out of the way. Let's look at Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. It says this. It says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding it in his hand, a great in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years or a millennium. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him, to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead, foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned, reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. <clears throat> The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, these six verses have largely shaped how people view the end times, haven't they? And so the questions become, you know, is is Satan bound now for a thousand years in the time that we're living in? Or or is that something that's going to take place in the future? Or is this just really figurative language and and a thousand years has another meaning? Well, you might remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the book of Revelation in chapter 7, and it spoke of this great tribulation. We said tribulation simply means suffering. And some speculate that this tribulation is going to last seven years. They pair it with some verses in the book of Daniel to come up with this figure. But some also see this as more of a figurative period rather than literally seven years. And that's understandable as well because we've seen throughout this series that numbers have different meanings. For instance, the number 7 and the number 12 and the number 1,000 all kind of mean completion or fulfillment. And so there are different interpretations that center around what some have called someone's uh, millennial view. Okay, and we touched on this a few weeks ago. There are three dominant views on how the end of times will unfold. And within those three dominant views, there's a lot of different variations. I just want to spend a few minutes going over these, and then we're going to move on from Revelation 20 back to Revelation 19. So the first dominant view about this millennial uh, period is the premillennial view. And this sees most of the events in the book of Revelation as future events. It sees the thousand years here in Revelation 20 as a literal period of time of a thousand years that has not happened, but will happen in the future. Therefore, in other words, right now we are living pre-millennial. Okay, so in this view, kind of the order of things would be that first, the church will be raptured. Second, there will be a great tribulation. Third, the second coming of Jesus will take place. Then there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ with the devil chained. And finally, there will be final judgment. Now, this view is, has been popularized, especially in the past 15, 20 years or so, with the writing of, of a series of books called the Left Behind series. How many of you have seen or heard or read of those books? Okay, There, there are like 16 books in the series all centering around their theology of these six verses. It's pretty amazing that you can come up with 16 fiction books based on six verses of Scripture. scripture. But anyway, so they, they have these 16 books, and then, and then they've sold millions of copies. That's why it's become so popular. And, uh, and also there have been movies that have come out from these books. And one of these movies featured one of the greatest actors of our generation, Nicholas Cage. I mean, just an incredible... No, I'm kidding. I can't stand him. But anyway, so the, that's the, kind of the premillennial view. And then the second dominant view is called the amillennial view. And uh, this view sees the thousand years as figurative, and it's going on right now. So this thousand years is the church age, and it started at the day of Pentecost. And although, and, and for the most part, the gospel is freely spread. Now, Although Christ does reign in the millennium, in in individuals, in in believers, in his church, the church still does face persecution and evil and cultural seduction along with the rest of the world. 
But Satan is bound. He, he's chained. He's, he's been pinned down by the cross. But he's kind of like a dog on a chain in this view, right? As long as we don't enter into his sphere where his chain can reach, we're safe. But when we enter in, that's where harm can take place. And so in this view, Christ will return, but when he returns, it will be once and for all, and it will be some future unpredictable time. So here's kind of the rundown of this, this view. In this view, you have a, a figurative thousand years where, where there's the reign of Christ and the devil is chained. Then you have tribulation or persecution, some happening possibly during the millennium, some at the, more intensity at the end of it. And then you have a rapture and second coming that are simultaneously taking place. They're more simultaneously taking place. They're not two separate events. And then you have final judgment, okay? So just as full disclosure, both Dave and I consider ourselves amillennialists, okay? We kind of hold to this view. At our Taze Valley campus, I mentioned that Dave and I fall more into this, this camp. And after the sermon, after the service, one of my friends texted me who's in that service, and he holds a different view. And that's fine, just so you guys know, there, there are people in this church who hold different views, okay? In fact, there are probably variations in our leadership on, on this, okay? So he texted me, and he, he, he sent me a couple verses. He said, you know, kind of pointing out, you know, how do these fit in with this amillennial view, you know? And so he was very kind about it. He was just kind of pointing them out to me. Um, and I occasionally have this happen, especially after I preach on a hotly debated or controversial section of Scripture. And so I responded to his text, and I said, well, obviously, you're a heretic if you don't agree with me, and I don't ever want to talk to you again. <laughs> Some of you think I'm being serious because you've come from churches where this is such an issue. You're like, they really would have kicked you out. I I'm joking, okay? So this, this stuff here that we're studying, it is confusing, Dave Stauffer, Stauffer and I, we were talking about this series, and we, and we were talking about all these different theories that people have. And I told him, I said, you know, there's not one theory, not one view where I couldn't point out holes or flaws in, in that theory. And I said, even the view that I hold, there are some major question marks, okay? So what's, what we're doing here at Gateway is, I want to just tell you up front, we do not make this issue a, a test of fellowship here, Okay? Like I said, there are people who believe different ways about these end of times. What, what's wonderful about this church is that we can differ on some of these non-essential issues and still fellowship with each other, still work together, still call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. I've heard of so many different churches where they, they have splits or they just can't get along over the dumbest of issues, over the smallest, over non-essential issues. Let's not be one of those churches, okay? So, there are non-essential issues that we're going to differ on, but I want to tell you there are some essentials that we have to hold on to, okay? So if you are a member of Gateway, or if you're just kind of checking this church out, you need to know that we unwaveringly believe that the Bible is God's word, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world, and it is only through him that we can have eternal life. And we believe, especially when it comes to the book of Revelation, we believe in a literal, physical second coming of Jesus Christ. We may not understand how it's all going to come down, but we believe in a literal, physical second coming of Jesus. We will not, will not waver on these issues. We don't believe these are gray issues or non-essentials, okay? So if you believe differently than that, you are welcome to, to come here. Welcome to worship with us, listen to the messages, sing the songs, even be a part of a small group. But you couldn't be a member here. And the reason I say you couldn't be a member here is because we ask you to profess this belief about Jesus. And, and you'd have to lie to do that, right? So uh, that, that's kind of what, where our approach when we, when we deal with some of these non-essentials versus essentials. The third dominant view that I want to hit real quickly it's called the post-millennial view. And this view also sees the th thousand years as a figurative period of time, but it's a thousand years of peace on earth, and then Jesus would come back. And the difference in this view is that most everything in Revelation 4 through 19 is, is interpreted as having already taken place, as having, having happened already. It's a retelling of past events, all cum culminating back in the life of Jesus, the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So everything that needs to happen has already happened, according to this view. It's taken place. But, but someday Christ will return to reign fully. But the millennium, they say, is right now and is functioning as kind of a golden age of the church in which Christian ethics are widely observed and practiced. And honestly, I, I don't know if I know anyone uh, personally 
who holds very strongly to this view, okay? So this is kind of a very distant third dominant view, I guess. Um, but I, I need to let you know that, you know, there are some people who just are very passionate about their view and their understanding of this, and they feel like, boy, I've got this down, and, and, I, and you know, this is the way I interpret it things, and you should too. And they kind of push people to interpret it that way. You aren't going to hear that from this stage, okay? We, we are opening up God's word and letting it speak to us and asking the Spirit to, to help us understand this. And so we're not going to get real dogmatic. Even though we kind of have our leanings, as, as the preachers here, you know, we, we have our leanings, uh, we are not going to force these views on, on people in our church, okay? And so though I lean toward amillennialism, uh, I'm really more passionate about a fourth way to look at things, okay? And, and it, so I'm, I'm more passionate about a view that I, I like to call the pan-millennialist view. Okay? And that is that it's all going to pan out in the end. Right? It's all going to pan out in the end. So live life as if today were your last day, as if Jesus were returning. I think that's the way we should be living, no matter what you know, view you might take on these things. Someone defined the millennium this way. They said it's the, th the millennium is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. <laughs> so let's, let's not get into a fight about this, okay? Dave Stone is the, the senior pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. It's one of our largest churches in our, our brotherhood of churches, our movement of churches. It's actually one of the largest churches in the nation. Um, and so he's a senior pastor there. But back in 1988, he was working at a college, Cincinnati Bible College, now called Cincinnati Christian University. And some of you might remember back in 1988, there was a book out by a guy named Edgar Wisenant who wrote a book called 88 Reasons the Rapture Will Occur in 1988. How many of you have ever heard of that book? before. Okay? It's not a huge seller anymore for some reason. I don't know why, but anyway, uh, in his book, Ed Edgar was convinced that the rapture would occur either September 11, 12, or 13 in 1988. Okay? Well, September 11, 12, and 13 came and went, right? And nothing happened. And so the next day, this, this guy gets on TV and radio, and he announced that his calculations were just slightly off, and that Jesus will actually return between 10 and 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time that day. So he's saying this in the morning, announcing it on TV and radio, saying 10, between 10 and 11. And so Dave Stone goes to his office at Cincinnati Christian University, and he hears about this, and so he decides he's going to have a little bit of fun with this. He comes up with a little plan. So he calls up the facilities department at the college, and he asks if they have like a really long rope he can borrow and a pulley system. And then he gets a couple students who play trumpet to, to come help him out with something. And then he called the, the professor of the largest class that, that would meet at 10 o'clock in the classroom building at the school. And uh, that, it met on the second story of the classroom building. And so he asked him, he asked the professor, he said, hey, could you just do me a favor during your class? Could you, before class starts, could you just open the window to your classroom and just leave it open for the cl entire class period? And also, could you, at the beginning of class, take role and just kind of say, hey, I'm going to take role at the beginning of class, and then at the end of class, I'm going to take role again just to see if anyone is raptured, just to kind of plant the seed is what he said. And so at 10 o'clock, all these students are in their class, and Stone, Dave Stone kind of gets things ready. He gets his two trumpet players ready. He takes that rope and he weaves it in and out of his clothing, okay? And then he grabs the book, 88 Reasons the Rapture Will Occur in 1988, and hands it, you know, puts it in his hand. And after a class had started, he gave the signal. And two of his friends stood on top of the three-story classroom building, and they started pulling him up the building, while the trumpet players at his cue started playing, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs> and so they pull him up, and as he gets to, to the second floor, right by the window of the classroom, he raises his hands in the air, and he says, Jesus, I'm coming home! And he says, I don't know why they aren't, but I'm coming home! And so they pull him up, up and all these students are just in a uproar about what he does. And finally, the two guys who are pulling him up, they get him up over the lip of the, the roof, and they're just exhausted. They're just sweating all over the place, and, and, and they, you know, they're puffing and panting. And finally, after they've caught their breath, they say to Dave Stone, hey, did you ever think what might have happened if while we were pulling you up, we got raptured and you didn't? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's why I asked you two to do it. <laughs> they didn't like that very much. But my point is, we should be very skeptical 
of date setters, right? Because even Jesus himself reminds us in Matthew 24, 36 that no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows when Jesus will return. That's why we've hammered over and over and over in this series that we need to be ready and we need to help others be ready, okay? So while there are a lot of things that we don't know, like when he will return and we can't always understand all the images in this book, there are several things in Revelation 19 that we do know. And so I want to spend the rest of my time this morning talking about three certainties that we find in Revelation 19. Three certainties that we can see from Revelation 19. And the first is this. First certainty is knowing that Jesus will return, is returning, is more important than knowing when he is returning. Knowing that Jesus is returning is more important than knowing when he is returning. So we can't get so fixated or dogmatic on our own personal biblical interpretation of the end times because knowing that he is coming is more important than knowing when he's coming and how it's all going to happen. So we're not consumed with anxiety. We're preparing with anticipation, expectancy, and, and we're sharing our faith with others because heaven is very real and so is hell. Hell is a very real place and let's face it, the lost really don't care what millennial view you have, right? They, don't, they couldn't give a rip. But what should matter to them is the fact that there is hope. There's the hope of salvation that's only found in Jesus Christ. And we know about that hope. And we need to be sharing it with them. My observation is that it's very easy for us to lose our sense of urgency. You know, we just kind of get wrapped up in life and we tend to put our faith on autopilot. You know, we need to remember... There is a world around us that is, that is in desperate need of a Savior. And they're heading toward a Christless re- eternity. And, and so we need to try and connect people to Jesus. He is the only hope that they have. So let's not get so hung up on how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen and where it's going to happen. The fact is, it is going to happen. Jesus is going to return. And so the question we need to ask is, are you ready? Are you ready? What about your friends? Are they ready? What about your neighbors? Are they ready? What about your children? Are they ready? Now, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, although we might not know exactly how things are going to go down, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, let me tell you this. You're going to love how it unfolds. You're going to love how it unfolds. You have nothing to fear as you read through some of these scary images that we read in the book of Revelation because in the end, Jesus wins. In the end, he is victorious. And as one of his followers, we share in the victory. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, my my point today is not to scare you, but I have to be honest with you. You're not going to like it. It's not going to be pretty. It will be separation from both God and man, as well as physical and emotional pain that we cannot fathom. Eric Alexander says, the real horror of being outside of Christ is, is that there is no shelter from the wrath of God. But we don't have to fear the end. You don't have to face the wrath of God because Jesus bore the wrath of God when he was on the cross. He bore the wrath of God for us. And so there's hope and there's victory found only in in trusting in the work and the power of Jesus Christ to save you. So Jesus Christ will return. And when he returns, he will return with power and with authority. And we'll read that in a little bit. But the second certainty is this. The bride of Christ must prepare for the wedding. The bride of Christ must prepare for the wedding. In scripture, the church is often referred to as the bride of Christ. And there will be a uniting of of Christ with his bride. There will be a wedding. So the bride must be prepared for the wedding. The bride must be prepared for the groom to come. In the opening verses of Revelation 19, it's as if heaven explodes in worship, thinking about the wedding that they're about to see. So let's look at verses 16 and 6 and 7, I'm sorry, of Revelation 19. It says this. It says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. The wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Over the past few years, I've had the privilege to be a part of a lot of weddings. And and I found there's one common thread in every single wedding. It's all about the bride. 
right? <laughs> it's all about the bride. When I meet with a couple for premarital counseling and we start talking about ceremony, I tell them my role is to help this be the wedding that you want it to be. But when I say that, I'm typically not looking at the groom. I'm looking at the, the bride, right? It's all about her. I mean, this is the day she's dreamed about. This is the day she's planned about. I mean, you all know this. You can go to a grocery store, and when you're checking out, you look at the magazines. How many of you have ever seen Groom Magazine, right? It doesn't exist. It's all about the bride. Ashley Fields here. She's our wedding coordinator. You know it. It's all about the bride. And some of them are bridezillas, let me tell you. But anyway, it's all about the bride, Okay. And so when I'm meeting with brides, I'll, I'll ask some of these couples, you know, what, what elements that they want in the ceremony? You know, do you, do you want, you know, a, a unity ceremony? Do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want unity candles, unity sand, all these different things? And when I ask all these things, the groom usually goes, uh, what do you think, honey? <laughs> and that's how it is. For every wedding, it's all about the bride, except for this one. Except for this wedding. This wedding is going to be different than any wedding that you've ever been associated with. This wedding is all about the groom. It's all about Jesus Christ. This wedding will be a celebration. And in the scene we just read, there's this great multitude and they're shouting something. They're shouting the word hallelujah. That word means praise the Lord. And this word only appears in the New Testament four times. And all four times... It's in the sixth verse stretch of Revelation chapter 19. As John describes this wedding of Jesus Christ with his church, we hear, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Look at verse uh, 7 again, and then we'll go into verse 8. It says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, the church, has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. So just as a bride's white gown uh, it communicates purity and allegiance, a Christian's purity and allegiance should be on display to everyone. It should be evident. All people should be able to see it. And like a bride, Christians are to be proud of what they wear and proud of who they are and proud of who it is they are marrying. So John is saying to you, he's saying, make certain that people know where you stand when it comes to your faith. When I do a wedding, one of the things I love to do is as I'm starting the ceremony, I love to watch the groom when the bride makes her way down the aisle. When he sees her for the very first time, let me just tell you, I'm, I'm not too ashamed to admit this, I sobbed like a baby when Sarah came down the aisle. She was so beautiful, and, and she still obviously is so beautiful, but what was amazing is she's walking down this aisle, and she's done all this preparation. She's prepared for me. For me, how humbling is that? How amazing is that? I mean, you all have, who have seen Sarah, you know that's pretty amazing because she's way out of my league. It's amazing that she would prepare herself for me, I know. But she, she captured my heart. I was proud to stand before my friends and my family and, and declare my love for her, my allegiance, my vows, my promises that I was making to her. And so the Apostle John paints this picture of a wedding and this marriage that exceeds all of them, all others in history. It's between Jesus and his church. And as Christians now today, we are encouraged to let the whole world know who has captured our heart. And it's Jesus. Later in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, it tells us who is not invited to this wedding feast, though. Because there are some people who aren't invited. And so it kind of talks about some people like the, the sexually immoral, the greedy, the impure, the idolaters. And we would kind of expect all that. You know, why, why would God want them to be at his wedding? But then it goes on to say somebody else who's not invited to the wedding. It says the cowardly. The cowardly are not invited. The ones who have been ashamed to declare their love for the groom, for Jesus. You want to be on this wedding list, okay? You want to be the bride of Christ who is prepared. And so it's time to be bold in your faith, not cowardly. Verse 9 says, Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. That's a list you want to be on. That's a wedding you want to be invited to. The third certainty is this. When the apocalyptic dust settles, make certain that you are standing with Jesus. When it's all said and done, make sure that you are standing with Jesus. 
I think some people have this, this skewed view of Jesus. Like, like he was some, I don't know, like ancient hippie, you know, like always preaching love and peace and, and, and always so laid back and easygoing. Let me tell you, this scripture that we're going to read, he is so much more than that. If that's your view of Jesus, it is an undervalued, horrible view of Jesus because he's so much more. He's so much more. Listen to this image of Jesus in his resurrected, glorified state. John writes this in Revelation 19.11. He says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. Now, at the time of John's writing, when he wrote this book of Revelation, when there would be a war, uh, after the battle, a king who was victorious, the, the victorious king, would ride on a horse through the city or the town that, that he had kind of conquered. And do you know what color horse he would ride on? A white horse. He would, but here's the thing. When would he ride that horse? He would ride it after the battle, after he had, was assured that there was victory. But here in Revelation, Jesus is on a white horse, and he's riding. And when is he riding? Before the battle. Why? Because he's already won. He won the battle at Calvary. He's now coming to consummate the reign that he's already inaugurated and validated. You know, Jesus will never, ever, ever take another beating again. That was a one-time shot when he willingly gave his life for us, for our salvation when he willingly took the beating on the cross. But that will not happen again. He will never take a beating again because he is a warrior who has already won the battle. Let's look at verse 12. It says about Jesus, his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And so we're kind of getting an imagery of his, his judgment and his authority as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 13, he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. Many believe, you know, this is very intense imagery, but many believe that this robe is dipped in blood and it's his own blood. Okay. Verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Now let me stop here. This, I, I love this section of scripture. Because it tells you something about the confidence of Jesus and his army. It tells you they're pretty confident. If they go into battle dressed in white, clean, fine linen, right? I mean, you don't go into a battle dressed in clean, white, fine linens unless you not only expect to win, but you expect to win handily, easily, effortlessly, right? Let's continue. Verse 15, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Again, this is imagery of his, his judgment and his strength and his ultimate authority. And this picture of Jesus, we don't generally see this picture of Jesus painted on a mural in the children's wing of a church, right? That might be a little bit intense for them, right? We see him holding a little lamb or something like that, but not with, you know, his mouth open with a sharp sword coming out of it. That would kind of scare off the two-year-olds, okay? Verse 16, it says this, On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written on it, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we see that Jesus is all tatted up on his thigh, right? right? Written on his thigh, it's, it's these words, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so kids, if you ever want to get a tattoo, you just say to your parents, you know, Jesus apparently had some tattoos, mom, dad. And parents, you have the right to tell them. Also, scripture says that you're supposed to obey your parents. And there are also some scripture that say if you don't obey your parents, well, they have the right to stone you to death, okay? So just to throw that out there. It's there, by the way. It's in Deuteronomy. Verse 17. It says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun. That's, that's a big deal, isn't it? An angel standing in the sun like it's nothing. He cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. It's kind of a nasty passage, isn't it? But you see, God's people, they feast at the wedding supper of the Lamb. But God's enemies, they are feasted upon by the birds of air. That, that, that doesn't seem very pacifistic, does it? <laughs> Verse 19, it says, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. 
And so we see that there are going to be some people, some kings, some nations who are against Jesus. And when he shows up, they're going to want to fight him. They're going to want to wage war against him. And in the end, they will lose. And they will lose handily. And it's their fault because they've declared war on Jesus. Verse 20 says, But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the, all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Again, these are good bedtime stories for your kids, okay? But here's the deal. Jesus deals with other kingdoms that are opposed to him by crushing them. Now, let me, let me remind you, th this isn't the church. I'm not advocating for the crusades or something ridiculous like that. We're called to live like Jesus did when he was on this earth, humbly, lovingly, with grace, mercy, and service. We pray for our enemies. So this isn't a militant church here. What I'm trying to tell you is that upon Jesus' second coming, when he returns, he will not come like a humble, marginalized peasant, not like he did when he first came. He will come as king of kings and lord of lords and he will put an end to all kings and kingdoms that are opposed to him. And we will see him in all of his glory and we will bow down before this Jesus. And this is the Jesus that you and I are going to stand before. And this is the Jesus that you and I want to stand with because he is victorious. And so this is not the typical groom, is it? This is a warrior who is taking care of business out of his love for his bride, the church. And the word that created everything can destroy anything when he speaks. In Revelation 19, Jesus faces off against all of our greatest enemies. I love what Mac, Matt Proctor writes. He says this, There is no breathtaking last battle. No mortal struggle back and forth. No spectacle of warfare to keep us on the edge of our seats wondering who will prevail. No moment when we think our cha champion just might be overwhelmed. Yes, the enemies arrayed against our hero are many. They are powerful and they are horribly wicked. But in that instance, in, th in that instant, Jesus just destroys them. He's that powerful. It's the most lopsided battle in history. He si simply dispatches our enemies. One, two, three, done. This is not Jesus in a manger. This is not Jesus who allowed himself to be killed on a cross. This is Jesus Christ with a chip on his shoulder. And the Bible says, vengeance, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And on this day, it's payback time. And you'd better be certain that you are standing with Jesus. Satan's feeble attempts at war are no match for the vengeance of God, which is, who is zealous for his people. And according to Revelation, Jesus destroys three different things. He destroys demonic allies. He destroys the devil himself. And thirdly, we read in Revelation 20:14 that he, re he destroys death itself. Let's read that. It says this in verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Now death is perhaps Satan's strongest weapon in his arsenal of evil. But Romans 8.35 assures us that not even death can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And yes, unless Jesus returns in our lifetime, we will still face death. The thing is, we just won't have to fear it. We don't have to fear first death, physical death. And when Jesus Christ takes us home to be in heaven, there will be no more death. And we'll talk about that next week. We must realize that we're going to either die prior to his return or we're going to be alive when he returns. And that's, that's the only two choices out there. That's it. One person said, born twice, die once. Or born once, die twice. If you are born again in Christ Jesus, you will not face second death. You will face first death physical death, but you will not face second death, which is eternal separation from God in hell. And so we have to live this life as if we are ready at any time for Jesus to return. So we wait patiently. We wait expectantly. We wait eagerly. We even wait e urgently for the return of Jesus. 
And whether we are in a thousand-year reign right now, or whether there's going to be some rapture and the Christians are going to be taken out, and it's going to begin a time of intense persecution and chaos, I don't know. But here's what I know. Either way, I want to be ready. Because heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And I don't want to leave this building today without being certain, absolutely certain, of where I'm going when Christ returns or when I die. How about you? Are you ready? When the apocalyptic dust all settles, when all things are come to their end, I want to be certain that you and I are standing with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's so much in this book that, that's confusing, that's difficult to understand, um, that, that causes controversy and debates. But there's one thing that we, we know for certain as we read this. Jesus wins. He has all power and authority. He is our mighty warrior who rides on a white horse and comes in and knows that the battle is over because he's already won. The victory has already been claimed and he handles it easily, handily, effortlessly. We serve a mighty warrior a great and mighty God, a champion. And so we can know and have no fear knowing that you win. We can have no fear as long as we're standing with you. And so God, as we've, we've tried to say over and over throughout this series, help us to be ready. And I pray that for those in here today who are not certain that they're ready, who've not placed their hope and trust in you, who've not surrendered their lives to you fully, who've not repented of their sins, who've not been immersed, who've not died to their sins and been raised back a new creation and have new life with you. God, I, I pray that they would make absolute certainty today that they're standing with you, that they would surrender their lives to you. I thank you that we don't have to worry we don't have to be anxious about the end of times. We don't have to try and get it all figured out of how exactly it's going to happen. We just need to stand with you. We just need to follow you. We just need to obey you. I thank you that you are our mighty warrior, our King of kings, our Lord of lords. You have the authority to defeat death and Satan and all Satan's allies. And you have the death to raise us, not just from the dead, but raise us to eternal life with you one day. And so God, we praise you. We give you all the glory and honor that you are due. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning we want to just close with two songs and uh, give you a chance to respond to the message. And so if if there's a response you need to make about Jesus, especially about placing your hope in him, I'm going to be up here to your right. Joel's going to be up here to your right. If you have a decision to make, we'd love to help you walk through that decision. Maybe today you just need some prayer. And so during these songs, you just need someone to pray with you. We'd be more than willing to pray with you. Or maybe you just need to grab a friend and, and pray with them here in this room or walk outside and pray. But whatever your decision is, uh, don't leave without doing something about it today. So I'll be up here to your right as we sing these last two songs. Will you stand and sing with us?